And I guess one of the difficulties in this whole issue is, is in fact that relationship that the WWF and other conservation organizations have with their host governments. And you're dealing with, uh, they're dealing with here some, uh, some governments that are really not the most uh, democratic or responsive mm -hmm. in the world. Um, and, uh, and in some, I, I know that in some of the issues that you looked at, for example, in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, there was, uh, there did appear to be some substantial level of knowledge on the part of the World Wildlife Fund about what was going on, but they just, they, they just sort of blatantly said that, um, that this was, uh, this, this was oversight from the host country's uh, wildlife agency and it would ups, what, what, what did they say? They would upset their relationship with them or mm -hmm. what, 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 what are the issue, the government issues involved in some of this? Yeah. So, um, I, I mean, it is, you know, and on this, you know, I, I think I have a sympathy for any conservation group because they, they do work in these amazingly difficult parts of the world um, and some of the state actors that they work with do not have the cleanest track records when it comes to human rights um, now you know in the case of uh, Solonga National Park where some of the worst abuses had happened it's now emerged that you know, WWF manager at the park had reported his own concerns about the about what had gone on at the park and um, and what happened when he did well, I mean, we don't know immediately what happened, but it seems like there wasn't widespread focus until an NGO started looking at it and then we reported it sometime later. Um, so, uh, I mean, the key issue really is uh, that, you know, if you're going to do this kind of work, you just need to have really rigid safeguards in place so that if things start going wrong, that, you know, you can kind of... Um, Put them under control again and well, I, uh, I, I think it's also important to add that wwf itself had said we ha before on this they said we would never let this happen we have these safeguards so it might be true that they are work it is true that they are working in these very difficult mm -hmm. areas and it's very complex work but they themselves have upheld a commitment to, to human rights yeah. and to say this shouldn't happen and that they're going to get consent from indigenous yeah. people and they're going to protect them and they say that's a cornerstone of their work so to say that and then be afraid to bother um, governments when they are, you know, when their eco guards are accused of gang rape and murder, as they were in Salonga, is I think it, it's going against their own stated values, which I think is important to note. I mean, what are the incentives as far as the governments go? I mean, I imagine that they, I mean, they have been uh, strongly urged and incentivized to deal with these poaching problems, right, and cut off the supply to the black market. So they might well respond that we're doing what we can. You, t you told us what you wanted us to do was stop poaching. Mm -hmm. And now you're telling us that you don't want us to work very hard at doing that. I mean, is, is, there, is there something to do uh, ab about the, you know, the, the contracts and relationships with the government that's a problem here? I mean, again, I think that at the bare minimum saying that, you know, gang rape is not acceptable when trying to combat poaching, it sounds like I'm being flippant, but, mm. you know, like it's, it's one thing to acknowledge how difficult it is and it's a complex issue and it's another thing to, to not, you know, double WF and it, it has started doing this more, but, you know, if, if poachers are, you know, if anti-poaching forces are accused of these horrific crimes that have nothing to do with protecting animals, they have to say, you know, you have to prosecute this, take it seriously, this can't be acceptable. Um, and I think, again, we're talking about these like very egregious crimes that are ob obvious. Um, it obviously shows that there's no accountability, no oversight, which, which to me is just a, a very basic first step, step that's not even that complex at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, uh, and then finally, uh, can we talk a little bit about, you know, this independent investigation that had been commissioned by the World Wildlife Fund? I mean, did you get the sense that it was really, truly an independent inquiry? Um, what, uh, to what extent do you feel that, uh, that it confirmed what you saw? Did it turn up anything that you hadn't known about before? And um, is this gonna result in any change in behavior, do you think? Tom, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, sure. So um, I think, um, I mean, with regard to it, 
its independence or its finding, I mean, certainly some groups, uh, certainly indigenous rights groups had, had been quite critical of the independent review, um, particularly in that it didn't actually declare findings. So there was no yes, no answer as to culpability, although it did outline a lot of issues that displayed clear culpability and advocated for some quite deep changes. I mean, interestingly, uh, one of the areas following on from what we were just talking about that they advocate for change on is PR, where they kind of presented enforcement and rangers in this wholly positive light. And then anything that was bad, they said in the report, you know, people wouldn't raise issues about rangers because they didn't want to kind of rock the boat. You know, they were, you know, they, they were a key part of PR. We don't want to like say anything bad about them. So, you know, it was um, like many of these reports, it's kind of a game of two halves, but I- So you felt like some, they didn't really do the job. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we feel, you know, it, it kind of indicates our reporting. So, um, and, uh, you know, it did kind of, there was a lot more to see the degree of detail in there um, was for us kind of quite an astonishing thing, you know. They found, uh, they reported stuff you guys didn't have, like really, yeah. I mean, you could probably do it, but didn't put it in your stories, but yeah, they had quite a lot. I think for me, it was gratifying to have our reporting validated. What was frustrating to me is that before our stories came out, something that WWF would do is whenever an issue arose, they would say, you know, we're going to create more policies. And then, um, you know, like there was, a, there was a lot of work done on paper and they had all these principles that looked really good, but then in practice, they weren't working out on the ground. And I think what I was hoping for was a bit more accountability and change. And it seemed like this report validated our reporting, but then suggested more policies. And the problem has never been policies. They've always had really good policies around human rights. And they've said, well, we're going to do this complaint mechanism. And we're going to do all this stuff. And so to see just the, the, the suggestions be more of that when it clearly hasn't been working in the past, I found disheartening because I think that more has to be done. But I also think that there has been lots of change and I think WWF does a lot of really good work and um, set, and I, I hope that now, you know, I, I have been gratified to see that in the past year, whenever human rights abuse allegations have arisen as they have in Nepal and, at, you know, in the DRC, um, I don't know, I can't, I won't say why this is different, but now there's no more secret reports, you know, now it's public, they say publicly, we're going to cut the funding, we're going to investigate, and their WWF is under a lot more pressure to do the right thing and be more transparent. So mm -hmm. I do think that's great. And I hope that they continue to to do so. But yeah, the report yeah. I did not think held the right people accountable, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think in terms of um, organizational accountability, you know, there's, there's a question as to whether that's occurred, you know, um, who dropped the ball and where. Um, but I think in terms of you know, also kind of systemic accountability is that speaking to people in the field, um, you know, that other conservation groups have taken note as well, that this was an issue that impacted almost, you know, a, a number of conservation groups. And in fact, as a sector, it's now starting to kind of um, uh, do a bit more uh, kind of self-assessment, even self-criticism around the history of conservation. It, you know, conservation has done wonderful things, but over its history, going all the way back to, to Yosemite National Park, it's also um, come at great cost, normally to indigenous groups. So um, hopefully um, there'll be more awareness in the future. You know, we, we certainly hope that will be the case. Yeah. Well, thanks to both of you for sharing the background to your just terrific reporting. For all of you who have not read uh, WWF's Secret War, you absolutely should. It will take you about two weeks, <laughs> I think. It's, it's, there's a lot of stuff there. There's a link to it on the OPC's invitation to this. And um, I really enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. It meant so much to get this award. So thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kim, Katie, and Tom. It was a fascinating conversation. Right, thank you. Take care.